lead poisoning. And lead poisoning used to happen a lot, but still happens in North America, in particular in old homes. And the reason is because in these homes, they have something known as leaded paint. And this was commonly used in homes until about 1960. By 1978, most of the homes in North America had eliminated the use of this lead paint. But what happens is a child or even an adult can still get exposure to uh, this lead when they either directly ingest the lead, like little kids, you know, who pick up pieces of paint that come off the walls, or if you are working in an environment in which the lead paint particles are in the air, then you can also, over time, develop lead poisoning. Now, if you do, there's certain very specific symptoms in kids and in adults and then there's one thing that happens in both kids and adults one finding that's common to both in kids basically a child will be irritable uh, there will be a decreased level of attentiveness and then later as this becomes more serious the child can develop encephalopathy and cerebral edema can also occur and the cerebral edema can cause nausea or vomiting it can cause the child to have an ataxic gait and if it progresses it can cause a child to also develop seizures so very serious in adults it's more common that an adult will get lead poisoning because of some sort of occupational exposure where they work in an environment where there's lead um, either in the air or in some other source. One of the things that they start to notice is their personality starts to change. The neurologic effect has a, a personality consequence. They also start complaining of headaches and then eventually neuropathy sets in. In kids and adults, both will present with the physical exam findings and lab findings of anemia. And it's a microcytic anemia. And the reason is because lead interferes with the normal formation of hemoglobin. So how do you diagnose lead poisoning? Well, a lot of it is based on clinical symptoms and uh, history that the patient has uh, lived in an old house or has exposure to a lead of some sort. And the first thing, of course, is to do a serum lead level. And normal levels are less than 5. So if a serum lead level is greater than 5 micrograms per deciliter, that's by definition abnormal. Another test, of course, that's done is the CBC, and that will show a microcytic anemia. And then a peripheral smear is also done and is beneficial in helping you diagnose this because you will see a finding known as basophilic stipling. Now, what is that? That basically is that you see these red blood cells and in the periphery you'll see these dots. And what these dots are essentially are ribosomes. So the red blood cells will show small dots on the periphery. That's what basophilic stipling means. In terms of treatment, you have to eliminate the source of the lead. And in North America, you can uh, call an agency and they will come and remove all the lead from the home or wherever it is, an old building. It's called the lead abatement agency. And then you need to give certain drugs and they're called chelating drugs and what they do is they bind lead and basically convert it into forms 
that the body can then excrete. And this, uh, these types of drugs are given when the lead uh, levels are very high. So you're talking about a lead level of probably greater than 45 in kids and in adults greater than 70. And there's two main drugs, the dimercaprol and susimer. Dimercaprol is usually used when the patient has some form of encephalopathy, so very serious. If the patient does not have encephalopathy uh, without it, then you can give susimer. Okay, a few clinical vignettes. Five-year-old boy and his family live in a housing development that was built 10 years ago. The boy tends to spend a lot of time at the friend's apartment in an old dilapidated housing development nearby. You notice that he has unusually pale skin and mucous membranes, and so you inquire about related symptoms. Mother tells you that she has noticed that he is significantly more tired than his siblings and has been a bit irritable lately, but she didn't think nothing of it. Several of his playmates are anemic. You decide to order a hemoglobin, hematocrit, peripheral blood smear, and schedule a follow-up visit in one week. He returns for the next appointment. You review the results. His hemoglobin is 9.5, hematocrit is 30, and the peripheral blood smear shows microcytic red blood cells with basophilic stipling. The most appropriate next step is... Well, it's a great question. And of course, at this point, with the history and the lab values, you have to think of lead poisoning. So definitely order that lead level. Next question. 47-year-old man recently consulted a physician about developing weakness, particularly in his right hand. Upon providing history, the man explained that he does house repair and has been working in a neighborhood rehabilitation project for the past several months. In doing this, he sandblasts and sands and scrapes by hand to remove old paint. These homes were first constructed in the 1920s and since have been covered with several layers of paint. He also revealed that he habitually ate lunch at the work site which he described as being dusted with old paint particles. In addition to the weakness in his arm, he had admitted to sporadic stomach aches, constipation, and said his wife had complained that he was always irritable. Upon exam, he did uh, show signs of right wrist drop consistent with radial nerve palsy, and CBC shows microcytic anemia. Serum iron levels were found to be normal. Which of the following diagnostic tests would provide the most useful uh, information regarding the appropriate treatment? Here's a situation where you have an adult, and this is an occupational exposure of lead. So definitely you want to check a lead level, which is D. And the last two, six-year-old boy is brought to the clinic by his parents who are concerned about possible lead poisoning. Since the age of three, their son has played at home of a friend where recently lead paint has been discovered. The boy has no medical history and has been healthy throughout his life. Which of the following symptoms is seen with lead poisoning? Well, patients can develop a lot of symptoms, but one of the more common ones is nausea and vomiting, usually because of cerebral edema. Which of the following lab abnormalities is commonly present with lead poisoning? Well, as I mentioned, the red blood cells will have these small dots in the periphery, and those small dots represent ribosomes, and that is known as basophilic stipling, choice D.